Okay, sure. Okay. All right, then this week's Hedra, the mitzvah maka of making a parapet or a fence when one builds a house to put a fence around the roof. The purpose of the fence was for safety purposes. Uh, a person could fall from the roof. So the Torah says, the Torah tells us that the Kisivna Bayis Chadash, Vasisa Makala Gagecha, you'll make a fence around your roof. Losasim Domin Bivesecha, a key for the Nopal Menel, Losasim Domin Bivesecha. You should not put something that could cause a person to have a fatal, fatal accident uh, in, in the house. So do not put blood in your house. Now, the Gemara in Sukkah tells us that the law of, of uh, the, the, uh, the, the law of building a fence around the roof, that applies only if a house is Dalit Amos, has the dimensions of Dalit Amos and Dalit Amos. An amma is anywhere between 18 inches and 24 inches. Now, included in these mitzvahs is not only, our sages tell us, not only build, building a fence around the roof, but let's say being, having a ditch in your prop, on your property that a person could fall and shalom get killed. So a person has a responsibility either to cover up that ditch or to build a wall around the ditch, a pit, or any obstacle that could cause such an accident. A person is required to remove from his property. So the question is, why is it that when it comes to building a fence around the roof, there is a special law that the requirement is only when the, when the house is Dalit, has the dimensions of Dalit Amos and Dalit Amos. In either case, if it's a danger, so even if it's less than Dalit Amos and Dalit Amos, and if it's not a danger, so why do we need to build the why do we need to build the, the, the fence altogether? Now, from the Chuvas of the Mabit, he has there a Chuvah from the Beis Yosef to him, and Chela Gimel of Chuvas Mabit. It seems that the, the, uh, in those days, the, the, uh, the, in, in those days, People used to sit on their roofs as if the roof was part of the household. Actually, in the time of the Beis Shosef, it wasn't that way. But the Beis Shosef says in earlier periods of time, it was that way. And the requirement of building a wall around the roof, according to the Beis Shosef, as it's brought down in the Chivas Mabit, is only in situations where people would sit or walk on the roof uh, as part of their daily activities. Now, it seems that when people are on the roof, people tend to be extra careful. They're on constant guard. So the Torah came to tell me that even though people are on constant guard when they're on the roof, if that's part of their dwelling, so then there is a requirement to build a fence around the roof. Why is that? But the answer is that certainly from the perspective of Sisa Makala from the positive commandment, of making a maka for your for your roof. So it's not just the requirement of removing the danger, but a person has to make 
make his house as a place where he, where he doesn't have to fear an accident. In other words, a house was made to have comfort in it. And if a person has to be on constant guard, if he has to be walking on eggshells to be sure that he won't endanger himself, then he is in violation of this mitzvah of a sisa makla So the Torah told us since people, that is part of their living situation. It's part of the house. In a sense, it's what turns a house into a home. So a person has to build a wall in order that he shouldn't have to be on constant guard about the possibility of danger taking place. Now, and what, what is this based on? This is based on the fact that there are areas in life where comfort is not only sanctioned, but should be expected. A home is a place that a person should be able to feel comfortable, shouldn't have to be on constant guard. But there are situations, there are situations, and I would say most situations, where, where a person cannot be motivated by comfort. The Gemara in Menachas tells us that at one time there was a dispute between the Prushim, between the Prushim and, and the Baisusim as to when the counting of Spherus Homer takes place. How we are to interpret the words of the Machras Shabbos, whether it means the day after Yantif or it means the day after Shabbos, whether it means Sunday or the day after Yantif, the Prushim following the Misora, they said Mimachras Shabbos means the day after Yantif. But the Baisusim, they said that. The, the counting of Svira begins always the day, always on a Sunday. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said to them, why do you say that? What is the reason? And there was one elderly by Susi who said, Moshe Yisrael, Oheb Yisrael Haya. Moshe Rabbeinu, Oheb Yisrael Haya. Moshe Rabbeinu was a lover of Jews. And he wanted that the Jewish people should have an extended weekend. So if we count the Sphira starting on Shabbos, so Shavuos, excuse me, starting on Sunday, Shavuos will always be on Sunday. So this way they will have Shabbos, they will have Shabbos and, uh, and Sunday as a holiday. In other words, everything is looked from the perspective of what, what is most comfortable. And there are many, even today, that their whole year centers around the vacation. Their whole life is lived for the vacation. And the goal is comfort. But while there are areas, as I mentioned, the home where comfort is even desirable, I'm not talking about the comfort of expensive furniture, but I'm talking the comfort of being at ease of mind.
but a halachic way of life is not one that is only comfort. In halacha, there is a lot of tension. We have to be concerned if a food is kosher or it's not kosher. In our, in, when we encounter business, is this in accordance with halacha or it's not in accordance with halacha? There is so much tension from a halachic perspective. As a matter of fact, I remember when I was a young boy, lived in New York City, in the subways, they used to have small cards. If you want peace of mind, join the Catholic Church. But the Jewish way of life deals with reality. And in reality, there isn't constant peace of mind. There are areas where there is peace of mind. But on the contrary, when you think that all of life is peace of mind, you become very, very disappointed. There is an interesting medrash in Parshish Re'eh, it's in the Sifri. The Sifri says, See, today I place before you a blessing and a curse. And our text of the Sifri, Das Ken of Baltos, seems to have had a different text of the Sifri. He says that the marshal, this can be compared to a person sitting, sitting standing at the Aim Haderech, at the crossroads. And there are two roads before him. One road is Chilasa Yashar. The beginning of the road is smooth. The sofa coats him. And the end has thorns. And the other road is the reverse. It was Chilasa Yashar. It's Chilasa coats him. The beginning is thorns. But so for Yasher, the end is smooth. And when we evaluate a brach and a klala, when we evaluate a blessing and a curse, we can't evaluate the blessing and the curse by the beginning of the road. We have to see what's at the end of the road. And perhaps that's the reason why the Torah says, Re'ei. Why didn't the Torah just say a note? He knows saying the fake I'm a young brother. Today I am giving before you a blessing and a curse. Why did it have to say Re'e? Look. But the answer is the determination of what is a bracha and what is a klola, what is a blessing and what is a curse, can't be told by the beginning of the road. On the contrary. Usually where the beginning of the road is thorns. Usually the beginning of the road, there is tension. You have to deal with the outside world and at the same time feel committed to Torah. At the end of the road, there it's smooth. But those who choose to have the smoothness at the beginning, the end, they have thorns. So life is not always, not every aspect of life, in fact, most aspects of life are not based on, on, on what is comfortable. On the contrary, we have to meet the challenges of life. And there are challenges that we all have and there are challenges that each of us as individuals have. But we have to know that Tchilaso, the road, the true bracha, is Tchilaso Kotzin, the Sofa Yasher. There is no whole road that is completely Yasher, that's completely smooth. And And we see this in another Parsha in the Sedra, 
regarding Yibum and Chalitza. The halacha is that if two, two brothers, there are two brothers and one brother dies and he didn't leave any children. So today we don't practice that. Certainly in Ashkenazi communities, it's not practice. The other brother ma marries the, the, the wife of the of the of the of the brother who passed away, Uman Yakim Shmobi Israel, in order that they should have a child who will be identified. Some say that child is named after the brother who passed away. So, and but if the man refuses, or the circumstances don't allow him to do it or there's concern that he doesn't have the proper intentions. So then he invokes chalitza. What is chalitza? The chalitza is that the, the woman takes the shoe off the brother and she spits at the shoe. What is the significance of the shoe? What does the shoe represent? But my father would say that the shoe represents adaptation. But today, shoes are a necessity. But in ancient times, shoes were not a regular necessity. Matter of fact, some of some posts can say, you know, you have to wash your face, your hands, your feet with warm water. On, uh, for Shabbos, some posts can say that was only in those days when people did not wear shoes, they had to wash their feet. But today that people wear shoes constantly, it's not such a requirement. But shoes were considered, it offered comfort. You didn't have to be, if you didn't wear shoes, you have to see what is on the ground. What are you walking on? Are you walking on pebbles? Are you walking on sharp objects? You had to be on constant guard if you didn't wear shoes. Shoes was adaptation, was the word my father would use. I would say, from the perspective of those days, Shoes represented the idea of not having to be on constant guard. It represented the idea for comfort, not the having to be on constant guard for comfort. And matter of fact, the halach is that a novel takes off his shoes doesn't wear shoes. And Ovel does not identify with seeking of comfort. And when you go on holy grounds, when Moshe Rabbeinu approached the snare, the burning bush that HaKadosh Baruch that God appeared to him. So he was told, Shal no alecha me'al raglecha, when you walk on sanctifying grounds, when you deal with holiness, you can't be motivated by comfort. The shoe represents comfort. Comfort is not something that has that should be practiced when you are involved with holiness. Matter of fact, years ago, when the dispute about the mechitzas took place, and there were those that said that people are more comfortable praying together with their wives. I saw it mentioned in my uncle's name, that my uncle said 
that on the contrary, that when you have a meeting with God, when you're involved in prayer, you can't focus on comforts. And this is this is part this is part of life. But specifically, when we deal with, from a halachic perspective, we can't be motivated by comfort. And what is unfortunate, that very often, when we evaluate the halacha, our negias, have an impact an unconscious impact on us that somehow we manipulate the halacha to work out from, from a perspective of comfort rather than from the perspective of truth. And it's very interesting. Uh, The, the, um, the Rambam, when he talks about Maka, the midst of Maka, of removing an obstacle that could be dangerous from your property, he says, any object that could endanger lives. Mitzvah asay lahasiro, there's a positive commandment to remove it. There's a dispute what it means, which mitzvah asay it's talking about. I think it's the vasisa maka legagecha, but there are those who say it's something else. But then, besides the mitzvah of removing it, the Rambam uses the, law, the expression, Uli shamar mi menu, and to watch from it, Uli and to be careful, Bedover, Yoffa, Yoffa, very, very carefully. Shenemar, he shamar Watch for yourself and, and watch your life, watch your soul. And so the Rambam here talks, look the expression. Besides Lesiro, move it, Uli Shamrit to watch from it, Uli Zoya and to be careful about it, Yofe Yofe. What is the Rambam coming to tell us? The Rambam is coming to tell us that when it comes to Sakonis Nefashos, when it comes to endangerment of life, you can't be motivated by comfort. You have to be on constant guard. And, and it's very interesting, this pasuk of, of uh, of uh, that the Rambam quotes, Yishamel Chosmo Nafshecha in the Torah, is not really talking at all about being careful about endangering one's life. On the contrary, it's talking about remembering Maimon Har Sinai. It's talking about spiritual matters. And yet the Rambam uses this same pasuk. Obviously, it has a basis in Chazal to tell me about the requirement to be focused on, on av avoiding and preventing danger from taking place. Why is that? Now, it's very interesting. In this week's Sedra, we are told the, about the mitzvah of Shulua Chakan. What is the mitzvah of Shulua Chakan? 
The mitzvah of Shalua Chakan is that if you have a person who's walking the way the Torah presents it, he's walking on the road. Medrash seems to imply it was a person who didn't have anything. And he's hungry. Of course, it applies to other cases as well. And there's a nest. And in the, in the nest, there are eggs. Or there are small baby birds that were just born. And the mother bird is in the nest. And this hungry person. So he, he wants to take the birds, the baby birds that are in the nest. So shalach shalach is saying, you send the mother away. Whatever the reason, there's a discussion in the Rambam and Ramban, others, what the reason for this mitzvah is. But the Torah tells us that there's a special reward for doing that. And what's the reward? In order that it should be good for you, the harach the yamim, and you will have lengthy days. Now, there is a similar reward mentioned in the Aserah Sedibros in regard to keep it vain, in regard to the mitzvah of honoring the parents. And there the Torah says, Laman Yerichon Yemecha, in order that you'll have long days, Ulama, and in order, Yitablach. And it should be good for you, Al Hadama Shara Shemel Kechanosela, on the land that, that God gives you. Now, but what's striking is the opposite order. When it comes to keep it Abe, when it comes to the mitzvah, the reward for the mitzvah of giving honor to parents of helping, helping to take care of the needs of the parents. So the Torah says first that you will have a long life. And then it says, Ulaman and it, and, it, and it should also be good for you. But when it comes to Shalua Chakan, to the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird, so then the Torah, on, on the contrary, first says, Laman Yitavlach. It's the, in order that you shall have it good, it should be good for you. And then, Beharach the Yamin, and you will live a long life. Why this difference? Why is it that way? And then there is another difference. When you look, at the Pasuk by Kibra Abain, Laman Yarichun Yemecha Ulaman Yitablach. So, as a result of observing Kibra Abain, of taking care of the needs of your parents, of showing honor to your parents, in order that you should have a long life and an order that it should be good for you. So it's almost like it's two separate things. One thing is the long life, and the second thing is, and it should be good for you. However, when it comes to Shiluah Hakan, the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird. So there the Torah, there the Torah says, it's like it's one thing. In order it should be good for you and you will live long. Like the living long is part of its being good for you. So why this difference between Kibra Vaim and 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 uh, and and Shalua Chakan, between the mitzvah of taking care of your parents? and Shalua Chakan, and sending away the mother bird. 
Now, Rashi tells us, the Torah mentions a number of mitzvahs, one after the other in the Torah. First, the Torah says, Abshulu Chakan. As I mentioned, the person is walking along the road and he sees a nest and he sends the mother away. And then the Torah tells us about the, the building of a, of a house that you have to put, as I mentioned at the beginning, that when you build a house, you have to put a fence around the roof. And then the Torah tells us about Kalayim, about, uh, about, about the uh, laws that have to pertain to planting. And then the Torah tells us about, uh, about laws concerning clothes, not having shotness, we'll, uh, and also the, the, the mitzvah of tzitzis. So the question is, Rashi's troubled, why are all these mitzvahs mentioned together? And Rashi says that it's mitzvah gareris mitzvah. It's to tell us that one mitzvah, that when you fulfill one mitzvah, it causes, an, it causes another mitzvah to be done. Now, but the, it's very interesting, the expression Rashi uses. Rashi says, Ki sivna bayis when you build a new house, in kiyamta mitzvah shlucha, shluach hakan, if you fulfill the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird, sofcha livnos by his chadash, as a reward, you will build, you will build a new house. The tekaye mitzvah smaka, and you will fulfill the mitzvah of maka. And I mentioned that from the Medrash, it appears we're dealing initially with a person who's poor, who has nothing, who's traveling on the road. And he encounters a, a nest and he fulfills the mitzvah of Shiluah Chakan. But as a result of that, his wealth increases somewhat. And he's able to build a house. But it's not just the mundane reward. The mundane reward that he gets is coupled with an opportunity to do other mitzvahs. And so on and so forth. Then he gets, he, he, he gets vineyards, he gets fields, he gets clothes. Those are mundane rewards. But each of the mundane rewards have mitzvos, have the potential of mitzvos that are associated with them. Now, I once asked I once asked my father about if somebody I was a young boy, if somebody's a non-believer and he does mitzvahs, is he fulfilling the mitzvahs or not? He doesn't believe in anything. And my father indicated to me that that person would be considered misasek to a certain degree. And he wouldn't be fulfilling the mitzvah. But my father's told me that there are exceptions. And the one example my father gave me as an exception was keep it out. And he said to me, you see, Esau, Esau was rewarded because of his devotion 
to his father because he helped sustain his father. So keep it up, aim for whatever reason is an exception to the general rule. Even though it's not done l'shem mitzvah, it's not done for the purpose of a mitzvah. Not only it's not done for a mitzvah, I'm not talking about mitzvah srikos kavana, mitzvah saint srikos kavana. But it's, it's done for purposes that have nothing to do with Torah, with God. Nevertheless, there's a fulfillment of a mitzvah. Now, what does Laman Yitavlach mean? Let's say by, by, by Shluch HaKan. Laman Yitavlach the Harach the Yamin. In order that things should be good for you and you will live a long time. As we pointed out, that's really one statement. It's not two separate things by Shluch HaKan. In other words, things will be good for you. And as part of that, you will live a long life. What does it mean things will be good for you? What it means things will be good for you is that you will be rewarded. Mitzvah, Guerrero, Mitzvah. But it's not just the spiritual reward. It's a mundane reward that offers you the opportunity to do other mitzvot as well. And that's why Shluch HaKan is the first mitzvah mentioned in Mitzvah Gereris Mitzvah. If you'll send away the mother bird, as a result, your, your wealth will improve. You'll be able to build a house. But the house itself is nothing. The house offers you the opportunity to do additional mitzvahs. And that will offer you other opportunities, other mundane rewards that will have opportunities to do mitzvahs with them. So man yitav loch, it should be good for you, means that you will get mund- you'll get mundane rewards that offer opportunities to do mitzvahs. So the the man yarichun yeme- uh, So when the Torah says the man yitavloch by Shluach Hakan, the man yitavloch it should be good for you beharach the yomim and you will live a longer life. In other words, the longer you live the more mitzvahs you will be able to perform, the more opportunities you will have to do mitzvahs. So it's all one thing. So that's why it's in that order. Because the beharach the yamim, the having an extended life, that's part of l'man yitavloch. However, by kibbut avayim, it's it's a Dover Pashat, in my mind anyway, that if somebody shows honor to his parents, but he doesn't believe in anything, so he will receive a reward. And the reward might be a long life, as the Torah tells us. But we wouldn't say mitzvah goreris mitzvah. When do we say mitzvah goreris mitzvah? Only if it's done as a mitzvah. But if it's not done as a mitzvah, then we couldn't say mitzvah goreris mitzvah. So I think this is what the Torah is telling us by kibbut avayim, leman yarichin yemecha. If someone shows, takes care of his parents, he shows honor to his parents, so he will have extended days. And then, if he does it for mitzvah purposes, because it's a mitzvah in the Torah, ulama, 
And then he will have an additional reward. So then you will, mitzvah, gereris, mitzvah will also apply. But the Torah couldn't put the two of them together because of a person like Esau. Esau will not have Laman Yitavlach because Laman Yitavlach is Medein rewards that, that offers spiritual opportunities. And that's only if you do the mitzvah because it's a mitzvah. But, so, but Esau does get Laman Yerichling Yemecha. So the Torah had to phrase it as two separate things. Now, and I think this is the idea of a chai behem. We live to do mitzvahs. How do we know that the, that Sakhanas Nefashis is do cheshabbos? The chai behem. You live in the mitzvahs. Shemor Chalel Shabbos Echad Kedei Shishmu Shabbos Harve. Sometimes we have to mechal one Shabbos in order to observe many Shabbosos. We have to see life from the perspective of the potential of its spirituality. There are those that treat Sakonis Nefashis today as if it was a life matter. They have a, an attitude. We have nothing to worry about. And they even add spirituality to it. It interferes with my kavan and davening if I wear a mask. They say that, uh, and I'm talking, and, 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 or, or uh, the, 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 uh, it, 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 it interrupts my learning. I don't understand. Sarkhanis Nefashos is a halacha. And the purpose of Sarkhanis Nefashos is not just to breathe longer. Of course, that's also part of it. But the idea of Sarkhanis Nefashis is we have to live in, a, in order to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. They view the world from the moment instead of the long term. They look at the beginning of the road without looking at the end of the road. They're concerned about the thorns at the beginning of the road, the discomfort. A flippant attitude exists regarding Sakonis Nefashis. There's nothing to worry about. Someone called me, says, someone called him, told him, go to the wedding. There won't be, no one's going to get COVID. Sure enough, that person didn't go, but the rest of his family did, and the rest of the family got COVID. How many people saw people dying this year? Rosh Hashivas, Rabbanim. It is a flippant attitude. I said to a person, what about this Rosh Hashivas? Oh, he had COVID. He didn't die from the COVID. He died from an illness that came after the COVID. Or another one. He died from COVID. Oh, he would have died anyway. The, ration, the rational thinking is lacking. You can't talk to these people. Why? Because their mind is not based up on logic. It's not based on halacha. It's based on what they want it to be. You know, we always talk about people who go from one posik to another to get a psak halacha. 
until they get the sock that they want. And we make fun of it. And the, 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 uh, but I remember when the, when the questions came up, so they went to a certain doctor and the doctor gave them certain instructions. But at a certain point, they no longer want, they didn't like what this doctor said. It didn't meet what, what, what would be in their interest. So what did they do? They looked, they searched. The way that the, 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 the Chazal tell us and the Navi says that the loss of love HaKadosh Baruch Hu will search for the sins among the Jewish people and he won't find it. They searched and searched for a doctor who would say what they wanted. And they had the chutzpah to talk about people going from one posik to another on other questions when they do it by Satanist confession. It's all the same thing. We want to do what we want to do. And even when people die, oh, that was for a different reason. It would have happened anyway. Now, this I think is the idea why the Rambam says, that uses the pasuk. Raki even though that pasuk is talking about spirituality, but that that pasuk is talking about us preserving Maimir Hasinai, preserving Torah. When we, we have to take care of ourselves because we have to save our lives. But in addition, as Jews, we only fulfill that responsibility, that spiritual responsibility. We take care of our physical being. That's part of perpetuating Torah. And when we perpetuate Torah, we should not look just at the beginning of the road. We have to look at the end of the road also. Unfortunately, people are looking only at the beginning of the road. Now, It's interesting in the Haptorah this week. So it says, Kimei Noach Zosli, God says about the Jews in exile. He says, It's like the waters of Noah, the flood waters. Because I took an oath that the waters of Noah will not go on the land again. So too, I took an oath not to, to get angry at you. So the Navi compares the Mabul to the Golos, to the exile. But the, the Zohar raises the questions of paying the Zohar. Ki, uh, ki mei noach, so sweet. Why is it called mei noach, the waters of noach? It's mei mabel, the waters of the mabel. So the Zohar says, noach bears responsibility. Noach should have gone. He should have acted like Avram Avinu. He should have tried to change the attitude of the people. And it's because he decided, because he didn't do that, 
that the people were that the people were not be were not saved. So he has a certain responsibility. So it's called May Noah. Why didn't Noah? Why didn't Noah do it? Could be that Noah felt it's useless, but it's never useless. And here is a, a responsibility that we have. We rabbis, teachers, Rosh Hashivas, those that are in positions of leadership, we have to bear a certain responsibility. We have to do our part. What we can do, we do. What we, we won't, what people won't listen to us. Okay, we tried our best. The question is, is there, are we seeing rabbinical leadership today on this issue? Or are we just, are we just dismissing it? The people are already used to not being careful. They're not going to listen to us. Now, it's very interesting. The Pasuk uses the word may noach twice. He may noach zosli ashinishbati maaborm may noach od alaritz. Because this is like the waters of Noah. The first flood. It's like the first flood of Noah. But he says, but I took an oath that there won't be a second may noach. The second flood wouldn't be noachs anyway. That would be much in the future. Why is it called the second flood that won't happen? But if it would have happened, it would have also been called May Noah. The answer is, that's the idea of precedent. Sometimes people get used to something. Sometimes if we don't speak out, even if we wouldn't have been successful the first time, first time will not be a precedent for the second time. Things happen by, 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 by it's the end of this week, Sedra, is Shira Samolek. By Shira Samolek, the Torah says, Asher Karcha Baderech Zachar. It doesn't say Schor Zachar. You have to constantly remember. You have to be on guard. Why do you have to be a god for Noah all the time? For 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 Amalek all the time. Why do you have to be a god all the time for Amalek? But Amalek set the precedence for the whole world. As Rashi says, Asher He made you cold. It's like a hot pot. And a person went into it and he was destroyed. But he cooled down the pot. When leaders do not take a position, the first time that is used for future times as a precedent, it's illogical, it's irrational. Amalek was destroyed. Why should anybody follow his example? But those are the facts. That's human nature. There's a precedent anyway. If Sarkonis the fascist takes precedence over the whole Torah, how can we not speak about it? How can we not talk about the importance of preserving Jewish life, of preserving life? Is it less important than joining the board of rabbis that all the Rosh Hashivas get together? But when it comes, even if you're not successful, but it limits the precedent that's being set 
So it's Kimei Noach. If there would have been a second flood, it would have also been Mei Noach. Because since the people said, mankind survived. There was one man and his family. But mankind survived. We're not scared. So the, the second flood is also Mei Noach. Rabbis have a... A, a, a responsibility, a responsibility to, 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 for right now and a responsibility for the future. We look back at World War II and we wonder where were the leaders? Why didn't they speak out? And I'm asking now, where are the leaders? Why aren't they speaking out? Because it's comfortable not to speak out. It's uncomfortable to speak out. Oh, Batam will become angry. They might join other shuls. He may know a he. We bear a responsibility. And the Torah tells us about Amalek, when did Amalek attack? When you're you were tired and worn out. You weren't on constant guard. Amalek waits for these times. When it comes to Sakonis Nefashis, we have to be on constant guard. And if we're not in constant guard, it's also below Yare Elohim. Because Yare Elohim, the Sakonis Nefashis, is not just the Metzius. It's not just an, a, a, an advice. It's a halacha. One of the most important halachas of the Torah. So this is... People are tired. They're worn out. They don't want to be on constant guard. It's a bother. It's not comfortable. I'd rather that life go back to the way it was. We all would rather. But life does not go back to the way it was and people come dead. So, this is Skoyemo Solom, Shninub knows Dovador, Shalabif, the Agetha, Skenecha, the Yamruach. There is a mitzvah, according to some Rishonim, of studying history. History doesn't mean studying dates when a certain treaty was made, it doesn't mean memorizing who the kings of England were. Skoyemo Solom means to the lessons of history. History is repeating itself. We are forgetting the lessons from 80, 90 years ago when we should have spoken out. We're forgetting the lessons from one year ago when we should have spoken out. Hello is a time when we pair for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippurim. In Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippurim, we ask for Chaim. We ask for life. How can we ask God for life if we're not if we're not willing to do our own part in preserving life, preserving our lives, and preserving the lives of others as well? As we march forward to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippurim. And we're going to say, Zerchainu l'chayim, melech hapeitz v'chayim, v'chaspeinu b'sefer ha'chayim. We have to know that it's not just HaKadosh Baruch Hu that has to be so cross v'chayim. We have to, we have to be HaKadosh Baruch Hu's partner in, in preserving life for us and for our nation and for the whole world. Okay.
Hey, thank you. Uh, anyone, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. There uh, is a question. Uh, when you were talking about, uh, when you asked your father, if someone who, who doesn't believe in Hashem does mitzvos, uh, if he fulfills a mitzvah. So when you were talking about that, someone asked, does that mean a person has to have kavana to be mekayim a mitzvah whenever he performs an act of kibbutz of aim? No, I said no. Does Mr. Tzrichah's kavana require a hinani muhan for every action? Obviously not. And does Mr. Tzrichah's kavana require a dual intent, an active intent directing the action, as well as the intent of kavana? No, it should, be a, it should be a general attitude. Would there be any difference between, uh, according to the uh, uh, Rav Nisim Gon, to something that would be a mitzvah without the Torah commanding it and something that's only a mitzvah because the Torah commands it? Yeah, the, I, I, I could see that distinction uh, being made. I could see. I could see that distinction being made. You know, but Shiluch HaKan, now the Torah revealed it, so we say it's mercy. Not everybody agrees it's based on mercy. It's mercy, it's preservation of the men or whatever it is. But it's not something that a person would have understood to do if the Torah hadn't mentioned it. Okay. Uh, in regard to Rabbanim taking action uh, about COVID, someone asked, what about Rabbanim telling people that they have to eat healthy and do exercise uh, to be better, to avoid diabetes, to improve diabetes? Yeah, it's 100% a, a, it's a true. One. Two is, but there is a halach of Dashu Bey Rabbin. So as far as Dashu Bey Rabbin is concerned, uh, it's Shomer Psayim Hashem. I think you gave a share about this, the beginning of our Zoom. Uh, yeah, thing. yeah, that's right, that's right. And the same person asked me the same question then. Okay, so I don't see any other questions, so thank you very much. Okay. Have a good week, everyone. Okay.